What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. Mm. Really want to hit the P on that. Yeah, emphasis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been working on it all day. It's good. AJ, word on the street is that uh, you won some sort of an award. I saw pictures with you mm. on Instagram. Explain yourself, please. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Uh, MUSC Research Day 2022. AJ, look, we can't even see your face on camera. What the heck? Oh, here we go. Uh, the AJ yeah, cam. Research Day. So is it like for the, um, for the school, for the college? For the entirety of the medical university uh, industrial complex. Mm. So it's farm, med, dental, everything. And then health, and then uh, what, uh, PhD program as well? Right, College of Graduate Studies. They include the masters and everybody else. It's that. very impressive. So how'd you end up uh, going that route? Like uh, I just kept faking it till I made it. Um, they didn't notice when I slid in and I just snuck my way in, started presenting. Nobody asked questions. I had a, my poster up and everything they're like how come we can't find this guy anywhere on the like on the yeah, the schedule <laughs> nobody's gonna ask questions if it's you're carrying his, around a giant poster it, that looks official it's his 12 o'clock lunch time and somehow he's up there talking <laughs> <laughs> no i was talking about uh the novel small molecule inhibitors that we created me and uh amelia or the listeners know amelia yeah right? she's amelia been furbish and so furbish. we found these uh novel small molecule inhibitors of spermine oxidase which means a lot to a lot of people i know and I've been sort of uh, evaluating them and chemo prevention. So I pretty much found a cure to cancer. And uh, I'm waiting on the Nobel Prize to come in. Yeah. Uh, but there's a there's a lot that goes into that politics. Right, 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 right. You know, from a humble yeah. perspective. Right. No, I get it. On it. It's, it's just all politics. It's all yeah. politics for you, dude. <laughs> that's really what it is. Well, that's well good. congrats, man. That's awesome. You know what I'd like to try? I'd like to go to mid-year. You know, not sign up or anything. Maybe I have to have an admission. But I'll just I'll, I'll dress up. I'll wear the suit. And I'll carry the uh, a giant poster that has complete nonsense on it, but looks very official. Very. And Bring something to prop it right up on and just start talking about it. I will say, while that would be funny, and I would support it from a funny standpoint, that might be the downfall of our podcast. Well, <laughs> well, first of all, the, the poster would be about our podcast, okay? <laughs> and then, consult, uh, host. And then have AJ walking around with a camera. And I mean, if you've got somebody vlogging for you, you got to be you gotta be important. Yeah. So, But again, the aftermath. <laughs> Yeah. Might be a sharp decline in listeners. It's possible. Instead of instead possible. of a poster, bring a clipboard and have a judge pen mm. on your shirt. Mm. Like That's you're like meditation. like you're grading them. And then yeah. just walk up to people's poster and go <laughs> They'll just start mm. talking. Mm. And just walk away. I'll, I'll just have little sticky note um, reviews that I paste on a poster. <laughs> no. Fail. <laughs> yeah. No. Try again. <laughs> just redo. Better luck next year, everyone. Uh well good job, AJ. That's awesome, man. Congrats, and you're, what, third year of farm school and then off to the PhD program after that, so more awards, I'm sure, on the horizon. Permanent student. Yep, it's good. We'll be riding your coattail someday. Yeah, someday. Yeah. Probably pretty soon, <laughs> once this comes a crash and burn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we are doing another accredited episode, ACP Accreditation for Continuing Education, uh, thanks to our friends at FreeCE.com, and uh, we are going to be talking about oral medications used for diabetes mellitus type 2. And we've, you know, we've covered injectables previously for an accredited episode. So this one, we're going to do oral agents. We'll kind of, you know, go through all the different, well, go through the majority of the classes that are available nowadays and, you know, get to hear our thoughts and we'll go through some of the data and whatnot. Um, so because it's an accredited episode, if you are a unlimited member of FreeCE.com, and uh, so you've gone to freec.com, signed up as an unlimited member. Because we've had to say this a couple times now because I think this kind of gets confusing. But unlimited members will automatically have access on FreeC's website under Learn. You'll see a podcast tab. You'll get access to all of our episodes. We'll link it in the show notes as well. Um, when you go to the link, you will have to input a password to actually have access to the post activity quiz or test, whatever you want to call it. And um, that will be today DM Meds. So. D M M E D S all capital letters. And that'll let you have access to the uh, post activity test that you'll complete easily and you'll get your one hour continuing education credit. If you are not a unlimited member of freece.com, make sure that you use the link in the show notes to get your discount off the membership. Join uh, the website. They have all kinds of great learning opportunities, live events, monographs, um, other recorded you know, lecture style content. And then, uh, of course, the podcast, which we have several uh, available now for continuing ed. So make sure you take care of that. Um, big uh, thanks to freece.com as usual for uh, continuing to work with us and, um, you know, Make sure you uh, check their website out. We've got lots of them on there. Yep. I was going through the list the other day, 
We've been doing this over a year. Yeah, I did. I actually was looking through some emails too, and I found some of the original. I was like, all right. Yeah. Rock and roll. We're going to run out of topics eventually. Eventually. Are we? Maybe. We'll have to start making some some long episodes out of some very <laughs> small amounts of content. Well, we can do it. Yeah, well, yeah, we can. We can, we can fill, we can fill, you know, ad, you know, ad lib stuff like nobody's business. I mean, how long are it's we? It's not going to be important. How long are we into this episode? Oh, we've we've already five killed minutes, five seconds. minutes. Look five minutes, thirty Look seconds. Look at this go. They don't even know what we're talking about today. <laughs> yeah, they do. I told them oral meds. Oh, yeah. See, Cole. Oh yeah, oral meds. meds. What does that tell you? But you did tell them DM meds. Yeah, so diabetes. Okay. We, and I said we went oh, through injectables. Oh, okay. Hey, Jay, have you noticed that Cole doesn't listen when we I talk? zone out during that part. I'm sure other people do, too, so I'm not the only I one. I zone out. That's why I have to think about <laughs> what I'm saying very hard. All right, so we are going to be talking about just oral meds, no injectables. And so, you know, this is kind of one of those things where we're going to more so talk about the medications just as they are, some comparative trials if they're available. But this isn't necessarily like in any set order maybe the first two classes would be but yeah. um we'll kind of talk about when potentially we could add them and when not yeah and, and i think there's stuff. some a little bit of confusion around that because people get hung up on metformin first and then glp ones and insulin and then where do the others fall we're going to talk about that yeah and just especially some of these like classes that you've never heard of where do they fall do they fall maybe not <laughs> so we'll give you some information there um so guess, we probably should start with metformin then Okay. We we're going to start uh, it uh, further down, but metformin, I mean, it is technically an oral agent. We, we were just gonna, we were if you want to get all technical, it. it is oral. We were just going to skip it. Um, so, to start things off, metformin, obviously very familiar drug for hopefully all of us. Um, if you haven't listened to our episode on the newer guidelines uh, for diabetes uh, management, specifically type 2 management, um, you may have, you know, not noticed, but hopefully, hopefully you've noticed that uh, the guidelines changed this year. And metformin, where historically it has been absolutely first line for every patient um, with type 2 diabetes, unless there's a contraindication, um, it's one of those things that it was always going to be first line, mon- you know, monotherapy if or as part of the combo. They've gotten away from that now to where they're looking at comorbidities, cardiovascular uh, risk, specifically ASCVD, um, looking at uh, heart failure, looking at CKD. And if any of those things apply, then we may start off with either a GLP-1 or SGLT-2 inhibitor instead and uh, not do metformin right away or, or at least first line. It's still usually going to be one of the, the first three med classes that you use, though, regardless of what's going on uh, for the most part. So there's there's two formulations available from a generic standpoint. There's the metformin and then metformin ER, glucophage, XR. Um, there's also, like it was originally brand name Glumetza and like Fortimet, which are extended release metformin that come as, as a thousand milligram tablets. Those are going to be a little bit more expensive because they use a different, um, more proprietary form of extended, or I guess mechanism for extending the release of the medication, um, like one's an osmotic release and whatnot. But the plain metformin ER, so, uh, 500 milligram is usually what we end up utilizing um, nowadays. We the, the plain metformin is still available, although, as we all know, the major adverse effect with metformin is the stomach upset, the diarrhea, and it is potentially pretty severe because a lot of times patients will have a, a bad uh, uh, time with metformin, and mm-hmm. then for the rest of their lives, you bring up metformin, they're ready to, to fight you about it. it. Pops up on the allergy list. Yes. <laughs> and so metformin ER, definitely a much better option for patients, a little bit easier on the stomach. And then from the from the study standpoint, when you see kind of like when they compare immediate to extended release, it gives you a little bit more benefit. From anecdotally, I, I would be hard-pressed to find another like I would say I'd be hard pressed to find a clinician that says, no, I've had just as much luck with metformin as metformin ER as far as compliance and mm-hmm. lack of adverse effects. So definitely, uh, definitely the good option. Usually we're going to start off with around 500 milligrams a day. Um, sometimes people go a little bit more intense, uh, initially. I, I personally tend to do 500 milligrams a day, um, with the biggest meal and then add on from there to avoid 500 twice a day. Then maybe one in the morning, two at dinner, two in the morning, two at dinner, eventually having a two gram total would be the uh, the gold dose um some things to think about from a like a box warning um there's a box warning on metformin for lactic acidosis and specifically in patients you know with more um more advanced ckd so specifically like it's contraindicated if the EGFR is below 30 mils per minute um and the the some of the i guess the this gets misconstrued because patients hear this and they think, oh, well, it's going to cause damage to my kidneys, um, which is not the case. I have had this conversation more times than I can 
probably count with patients who think it's bad for their kidneys or they have CKD, so they can't do it um, or can't take it rather. But the lactic acidosis is only a risk if the patient has that more advanced CKD, like specifically less than 30, like we said, um, EGFR less than 30. It's not going to cause the, the kidneys to actually have you know, it's not going to cause damage to the kidneys or, or put the patient at risk for lactic acidosis who don't have um, CKD. And, you know, it's one of those things that the old um, Fenformin that was on the market previously, um, kind of the earlier predecessor of Metformin, was much more notorious for causing uh, lactic acidosis. And so when Metformin, you know, kind of came on the scene, then we sort of just grandfathered those effects in with, uh, with, you know, the metformin is just like we had with fenformin. Right. Um, so not going to cause an issue with, with the kidneys, unless the patient already has preexisting kidney disease with an EGFR less than 30. Right. Um, there's also, you know, some risk if the patient has like an acute decompensated heart failure, they used to have it for just congestive heart failure in general as a, like a, almost a contraindication or at least a warning. It's not usually something we worry about. Maybe in patient, we would stop it if they were having an acute decomp episode, but from a heart failure standpoint, you can still utilize metformin, um, especially in control patients. Um, you would want to hold, hold it if they were, you know, septic or if they were, uh, you were, you were thinking that they were going to have some sort of an iod, um, iodine based contrast, uh, for an imaging study, then you would also hold metformin because that mm -hmm. can, um, interact with it as well. But other than that, it's not going to cause damage to the kidneys, not going to cause damage to the liver, which is another one I hear. Uh, metformin is a, a pretty effective medication. Yeah. It pops up on those 1-800-BAD-DRUG commercials a lot. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Is it just because it's so common? Probably. Probably. Um, so if you're following the label and not using it in patients who have chronic clearance less than 30, then that lactic acidosis risk really isn't there. And I think it also says to not initiate under a certain chronic clearance 45 or something like that, which... You know, I tend, yeah, I tend I, to not the, really. Yeah, focus the main on that thing much. I focus on is more so maybe I'll cut the dose if I'm or not push the dose as high if they're in that, you know, 3B you know, uh, range of EGFR, right. but I tend to not worry too not much worry about. Too much. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, so, one positive thing about metformin and a big reason why it was always first line for everybody no matter what is because it's other than those possible risks in the stomach upset it's very low risk for hypoglycemia so it doesn't have a direct stimulus on beta cells so very low risk compared to other drugs that were out there uh, previously like um, those fonorrhea and other ones we'll talk about um, and then it had pop data with positive outcomes so that's why we wanted everybody on it very safe possibly cause some weight loss which is good uh, but the stomach upset cramping flatulence nausea vomiting diarrhea possibly that sort of thing are the main things to be worried about. So Mike touched on it, but make sure they're giving it with a full meal, um, uh, using the ER formulation, and then titrate slowly, like Mike said. Um, it can also deplete intrinsic factor. Uh, what would that do? It could possibly decrease B12. So you'd want to monitor um, their B12 for possible B12 deficiency. Um, so the American Diabetes Association recommends periodic B12 testing especially for patients with anemia or peripheral neuropathy. So do you, thinking about these guidelines, say you chose an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 first, is there any negative to once you get them, you know, established on that to going ahead and give them metformin unless they just reach goal? No, I mean, for me personally, that's kind of my strategy of, of SGLT2, GLP-1 or metformin, whichever one or a combo of the those three are starting off, um, usually I'll use a two-drug combo because most of my patients are going to be much worse right. A1C control. Mm -hmm. So I'll usually do a two-drug combo. Whatever the third one was that I didn't use initially would be my next add-on if possible. Right. And then I'd go like basal insulin and stuff. Right. Right. So that's usually my strategy unless there's always obviously outliers, but for my just, you know, population-wide mm -hmm. algorithm in my own head, that's kind of what I do. Right. Right. I will say the B12 thing is pretty interesting because I feel like at least again, like anecdotally, just from my experience, I feel like there's potentially even like a little bit of a placebo effect too, even if they don't have, because I've had some patients who I get their B12 level back and it's normal, mm -hmm. um, but they start taking a B12 supplement and magically their peripheral neuropathy or their diabetic neuropathy goes away right. um, or at least improves. So I've had several patients that that's kind of happened to. So I, I will say if, because B12 is a oral or a, a water-soluble vitamin, it's not something that is a big deal if it does kind of build up in your system, mm -hmm. you know, 
relatively. Um, it's something that I tend to not even draw a lab for B12. I tend to just say if they're having peripheral neuropathy, maybe try it first and then kind of hopefully if, if it is low, it'll correct it or maybe it get a little bit of placebo effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know. That's my personal, again, yeah, that's just my opinion, but it definitely, uh, definitely noticed people getting improvement, even right. if their labs don't. Yeah. And if you tell <laughs> them that, it. oh yeah, it could be because this is low and you give it to them, then it's one yeah. of those things. But yeah, so it's definitely a good option still, even though it's not necessarily first line. Um, definitely don't forget about our oral buddy metformin. No. And there was a little data we could touch on too about metformin. Another reason why it was considered an important medication, still is considered an important medication. The home trial, we've talked about it before, um, but effectively showing there wasn't necessarily the cardiovascular benefit um, that you might have hope to see your have seen in um with other medications so it was a small trial with about 400 patients it was metformin versus placebo it was added on to insulin they had a primary endpoint composite of microvascular and macrovascular morbidity and mortality which didn't have a difference uh, between placebo which wasn't great but they did decrease um, the daily insulin requirements in those patients by 19 units and there was a decrease in macrovascular events um, with a number needed to treat of 17 plus a little more a1c reduction um a, it, it had a little weight loss or at least prevented weight gain from the insulin. So another reason why metformin added on to insulin can be good. Yep. All right. So moving right along, we'll talk about our one and only oral GLP-1. Semaglutide, brand name Rebelsis. Um, you're probably more familiar with, with semaglutide under the brand name Ozempic, which is the injectable version. It's also one approved for weight loss called Wigovi. Um, but semaglutide is definitely uh, a, a good option. I will say um, it is available as an oral option. Uh, I think it really depends on your patient, though, with whether or not that's going to be a feasible option for those patients. Um, so administration is really important with the oral version of semaglutide. The, according to like the package insert and whatnot, you want to give it on an empty stomach about 30 minutes um, or a little bit longer before the first you know, food is consumed or beverage or other oral medications. So potentially because we're worried about the, the limited bioavailability, the limited absorption when taken orally, we don't want to give it with any other meds um, that could potentially you know, mess with that absorption rate. Just think of it as almost like a levothyroxine type thing. Yeah. But the problem is the food part of it. You have to take it in your stomach, but then you have to follow it up with a meal 30 minutes to an hour later. Um, it also needs to be taken with four ounces of just plain water or less. And what I was, what's kind of interesting is I was talking uh, to a medical science liaison for this, uh, for this medication, and they were saying there's some data showing that even a sip or two of water is better than the four ounces. So it's like it's that like sensitive to yeah. to the bioavailability and change of, you know, whatever else you're consuming. Which was the whole reason we had to have injectable GLP-1 for so right. long in the first place. Exactly. So I do personally tell patients, um, take it with a sip or two of water if you can, just to get the pill down and then go from there. Don't try not to go the full four ounces, which in four ounces is nothing anyway. But yeah. I, I try to do that based on, you know, what that medical science liaison was talking about, just to hopefully get the, the most bang for our buck. Yeah, you should say a sip or two. As long as it's less than four ounces, because some people some, some people, people sips, big sip. yeah, gulps. So yeah, the, it it is getting a little bit difficult. And then also too, you have to eat thirty to sixty minutes after taking the dose. So you yeah. got to make sure that it's fasting when you take it, but then actually remember to eat after the fact. I mean, it's annoying enough with like a PPI and yeah. having to time oh, yeah. those things correctly. I mean, it's it really is intrusive on somebody's yeah. daily, especially when you have weekly injectable options, right? You know. Yeah, I've uh, I've talked to people um, who say they've had good results with Rebelsis. I know personally I have not with my patient population that I've tried it with. Um, there's been a couple patients who are just absolutely refusing injectables and also refusing insulin, mm -hmm. um, obviously. And so this kind of is one option we just tried, but I've, I've seen very few. And then even after the whole spiel about take taking it properly and all that you ask them at the next visit when their a1c doesn't change how are you taking it take it what do you mean take it in the morning with all my other meds yeah <sighs> yeah <laughs> so you know that's again that's just my um sort of what's the word experience with yeah. the medication not saying it, i'm sure there's plenty of people who have had good results with it um but it's definitely one that you know I would say uh, maybe consider the injectable version first, yeah. if possible. It was very exciting when it came out. Yeah. Um, 
Not to mention we tend to have some some better. Uh, we're not talking about GLP one injectables today, but we have a, some better cardiovascular Malcolm, outcomes Malcolm data, with yeah. with some of the others as well. But it's going to work like the other GLP ones. It's going to increase insulin secretion, decrease glucagon release, slow gastric emptying. Um, so it, it can have those benefits, possible weight loss, uh, similar things to GLP ones, which is good. It's also similar adverse effects as far as um, nausea and uh, constipation, stomach related things. Um, and you don't want to use it with a DPP-4 inhibitor. So all those are true. It's just the very specific dosing is just a tad bit annoying. Yeah. And I, and I would I have to double check. Maybe, AJ, you can find this. But uh, the the law, the weight loss associated with it was definitely less yeah. the oral, with the oral semaglutide than like the injectable right. semaglutide. Right. Um, but if insulin and GLP-1s aren't on the table. Yeah. So then you're going like metformin, SGLT-2, oral GLP-1. Right. You know, then your options are a little more limited. The one pioneer study that they compared it to um, Victoza head to head showed 4.4 milligrams, or I'm sorry, kilograms um, decrease from baseline with semaglutide, with oral semaglutide, and 3.1 kilograms with uh, liraglutide. Mm. So um, I would say injectable semaglutide is a little bit more impressive and probably what you'll be seeing for, for weight loss if you are trying to capture that side benefit, if you will. Right. Um, but you know, like Cole said, good option for if you need an oral option or an oral agent that's uh, the patient's just terrified of injectables. Right. Right. It's uh, the just to throw this out there, um, just since I collected some anecdotal evidence, uh, what's really interesting about the weight, like the loss part of it or the appetite suppression. So I've actually, and then I, the one I used personally was uh, Manjaro. I just, I gave myself a shot of that just to kind of, I wanted to I really just wanted to see what it would do to appetite and whatnot. And, uh, so, um, got, uh, I did an injection of Manjaro and, and it cut my appetite like immediately. It was really weird. Like if just, and I felt, I never, I didn't feel like hungry, like hungry, hungry. And then once I would actually like eat when I did, once I finally did feel like I needed to eat something, when I would eat, I would get full so fast. It's really bizarre. So I wanted to get that, uh, that out there since I did some testing on myself. So interesting. But it was, it blew my mind. Cause I kind of figured like, and, you know, it, it, I mean, I have a pretty big appetite, so it may be able to decrease it a little bit. And, like, it wiped my appetite out. My wife was like, are you okay? I couldn't <laughs> imagine. Like, I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, it really blew my mind. I don't have a huge appetite at baseline. You might not eat for days. <laughs> I just might stop eating. Uh, but there's some things I really enjoy. It's like if I couldn't sit down with a whole plate of hibachi and, like, down the whole thing, you know, it'd be kind of... I ordered, I ordered hibachi. This is a real story now. We're way off topic, but... Um, <laughs> As I opposed to all the other fake stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know why I said that. But uh, so I ordered some hibachi and a, like a sushi roll. Yeah. And usually I eat both of them like no problems from one of our spots we always order from. Yeah. Probably cost more than $12. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I literally ate like maybe half of the hibachi and I was starving when like the food came. I didn't touch my sushi roll, but had, had lunch the next day. So look at me that's saving true. money, saving money. Hmm. Yeah. Just like, Cole. and those, th and that stuff is specially formulated to just keep you eating that, and I, and that I, I beat the system, that white sauce that they're now calling yum yum sauce everywhere. Yeah. It's like, it, it wants you to keep going. It's delicious. But you beat it. I beat it. That's I found a, a loophole. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, just thought I'd throw that out there in case any of you were wondering, but, uh, what about the comparative studies with semaglu oral semaglutide to get back on track yeah tell us about that um so it was superior as far as a1c lowering uh, when compared directly to impagliflozin and jardians which i thought was kind of interesting um i will say again obviously these patients probably their adherence was a little bit better uh, because they were in the study and whatnot than you'd maybe get in real life but uh it was superior a1c lowering to impagliflozin also um citagliptin genuvia which that that doesn't surprise me and uh about this it was the same as uh liraglutide victoza um unfortunately though as of yet there has not been any cardiovascular um, outcome data that has been positive for semaglutide. No, no harm, but no positive outcome data or no benefit from a cardiovascular outcome standpoint like we have with Trulicity or um, even somewhat with uh, the injectable semaglutide. Yeah. So I don't know if it's just this agent in general because semaglutide's data is definitely not as good as like um, delaglutide or something. Or, yeah, I've even Victoza that to, to somewhat. But uh, with the oral version, no cardiovascular benefit at all. So I'm, I guess it, it's probably going back to the absorption and how much is actually getting in your system. Um, but uh, don't expect to be, I would say if the patient has baseline ASCVD, maybe go 
you know, stay away from this one if possible and go with the injectables that mm -hmm. have data there. Yeah. Cause and the guidelines will kind of follow that too. Yeah. So. Okay. Throwing that out there. So next, which, yeah. So not, that's sitting in any particular order, but GLP ones, you might naturally go for in second line or around the metformin. We kind of talked about how any of these three are, are reasonable options, but in of those other two, if they have ASCVD, then you would want to go with a GLP one yeah. first, first line. So, and if you look at the, I pulled up the guidelines too, and it does say sub Q semaglutide specifically for ASCVD. So yeah. they do. Yeah. They're they specify. spot on. Um, so SGLT twos next. So we had an episode talking more specifically about SGLT twos and heart failure, Obviously, now we're going to do a deep dive into diabetes related to SGLT2s. Um, so we have four of them, the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, um, three primary ones, Invocana, Farsiga, Jardians, um, and then there's another one, Stiglacho, which is, I guess, the relatively newer one. I was looking, and um, even though we have new data with oral diabetes meds like SGLT2s, there hasn't been a new oral med approved in a long time. I think 20... 14 or 2015 was the last SGLT2 approved, and that was like the newest oral diabetes med other than like a metformin combination or something like that. Or, um, or, or, um, Stiglatro? Maybe Stiglatro was, I guess I it might have been a little newer. bit more recent because I was looking at the Jardians one. My, my guess is probably because the data is so good with yeah. dipagliflozin and impagliflozin, and even to some extent canagliflozin, right. that they everybody saw what happened to or triglyphlozin, and we're like, ooh. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't make any more. Maybe we shouldn't make any more of these. Um, but all the new stuff is injectable. So we, we haven't gotten a whole lot of new oral stuff for the most part, but um, they inhibit SGLT2 in the proximal renal tubules. They reduce the reabsorption of filtered glucose, and they lower the renal threshold for glucose. So they're expelling glucose. They're getting rid of it um, through the urine. They're extruding it through the urine, and that's how they work. Um the dose is based on EGFR, and if their creatinine clearance is less than 30, it's not recommended to use. Um, or A1C lowering. For A1C lowering, not recommended to use an SGLT2 because they're not going to see the benefit because of the mechanism and how it works. It's, they're not going to see the A1C benefit at low creatinine clearance. Yeah, and we'll circle back to that when we talk, when we review real quickly the CKD data again. But um, you know, less than thirty was the original cutoff for EGFR, and then now we've act, we have data down to twenty in heart failure and things like that. But the A one C lowering is not going to be there, like right. I said. Um, as far as like warnings, um, some things to watch out for would be, um, euglycemic ketoacidosis. So instead of like DKA, these patients blood glue. In fact, this happened where we were worried about a patient. Um, that one of our PAs had started, you know, the, the, was one of my, you know, colleagues that I work with was saying, uh, you know, kind of worried that he was the one that induced like this patient in a DKA cause he gave her the, uh, um, an SGLT2 inhibitor. But when they looked at her, uh, blood glucose, when mm -hmm. at the time of admission, it was like crazy high. Right. So, um, it, it's usually euglycemic ketoacidosis if it is going to cause that, but that can happen. Um, it can also cause, uh, mycotic infections. Um, it can cause, uh, pyelonephritis. It can cause hypotension to some extent. Um, AKIs that are usually, um, resulting from, uh, dehydration in general. Um, and so the, some other kind of adverse effects, it, the way that it's working is it's lowering that reabsorption threshold of glucose. So instead of being, you know, 180 to 200 ish before you start uh, having reabsorb or before you start blocking the reabsorption, it lowers it to where you can only reabsorb about 90 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, and it just flushes all the rest of the glucose out. So because of that, hypoglycemia you know, by itself isn't supposed to be a huge risk because you're still absorbing enough glucose to keep you euglycemic. But when you add this on to other meds that can cause hypoglycemia, then obviously that risk goes up. But we haven't seen a huge issue with hypoglycemia in our non-diabetic patients that are using this for CKD or heart failure. Yeah, yeah they generally still consider it low yeah. risk. Um, but technically speaking, that can happen. Yeah. Um, increased urination obviously is going to happen because you're flushing out all that glucose, uh, mm -hmm. which glucose, water, sodium, all that stuff's going to be following. Um, you will get potentially an increase in serum, potassium, and magnesium, uh, as well as uh, phosphorus, phosphate. So um, really the main one to focus on there is the hyperkalemia, because if they're also on you know, some sort of a RAS inhibitor with ACE or ARB, um, they're on spironolactone, they're on anything like that, they're on actual you know, KDER or a potassium supplement, this could offset it a little bit. Yeah. Um, the... The volume depletion that we see is obviously in and of itself, you know, 
not a bad thing, especially if they have common like heart failure or something, but if the patient's also on diuretics, they're also on other um, things that could affect volume depletion, even, you know, NSAIDs, things like that, then we obviously could have that risk of dehydration and eventually like an AKI or something along those lines. Um, the yeast infections are probably the biggest issue that I've hear, you hear people complain about, and this is even in men. Um, and so, you know, it's something that in some patients you may want to give them kind of a as needed, um, fluconazole tablet to take. Um, it's, it's usually pretty easy to treat, um, but it's one of those things that, um, we just want to make patients aware of given the, that much glucose in the urine, it's basically giving the yeast a, a buffet to survive on. And so, um, I, I will say though, as the blood glucose goes down, the frequent urination and the risk of yeast infections tends to kind of go down with that because mm-hmm. there's not as much glucose in the, in the urine. So right. I always throw that out there to patients just to kind of encourage them that, uh, you know, this, this will get better and just to kind of keep an eye on any itching or, um, you know, burning sensation or anything like that. UTIs can also happen as well. Yeast infections tend to be a little bit more common though. Yeah. And they say drink a lot of water can help with the genital mm-hmm. urinary infections and preventing the AKI. I had a patient who was started, I think on Jardians and, um, he had a number of UTIs. I think after his third, they told him if he'd had one more, they would take him off it, but he didn't have any more start drinking more water and whatnot. And it worked out, but, um, yeah, definitely a possibility. Yeah. So as far as the data, so uh, SGLT2s. Um, oh, wait, real quick. Oh, go we got to talk because some people will get some weight loss from this as well. Mm-hmm. But one of the biggest, you know, throw that out there, but also one of the biggest concerns I would say um, to be aware of, and this is rare, but it can happen. So just be aware that it I can. I thought you were going to glance over it, so I wasn't even going to say no, it. No, I'm going to, we got to. Um, so 40 years gangrene. There has been case reports. I've actually talked to one patient um, who actually experienced this when Jardians, I think it was, first came out. Um, but Fournier's gangrene is definitely an emergency situation. And, uh, you know, it needs to be at least aware of. So especially like male patients who tend to be, you know, from a statistical standpoint, tend to be less likely to seek care, especially from a genital type problem. Um, if you and they notice any sort of like discoloration, swelling, soreness, you know, redness, soreness, whatever, um, you know, they need to make sure they seek help because if, if, if not caught early enough, it can be very problematic. Um, AJ, very problematic. For those of you who uh, have a weak stomach, don't look at my, don't look at the video version of this, but AJ, switch over to my computer real quick. I'll show you a quick, uh, that's okay. Not for I have the, all these rated for not for kids, so uh, we're all medical professionals. Um, but yeah, if you're watching the video version, you can see that's a uh, a illustration of what can happen. It's pretty disgusting, very disturbing. So um, make sure you tell patients to let you know if there's any issues there. Yeah, go ahead with the comparative data. Cole. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So the, kind of the first trial to come out was with Invocana, and it was the Canvas trial. Um, and it had some positive data, positive cardiovascular data, um, some leaning towards some positive renal data. So with a combined endpoint of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, it had a number needed to treat of 223. This was around the time that, I think it was a little bit after, like the um, the leader trial came out and, and the JLP-1 data came out. I think these followed. Um, so that was the first like, oh, we can have some good cardiovascular benefit from SGLT2s. This is a good thing. Um, they reported the data in, in events per thousand patient years, which is really annoying. But when you calculate the number <laughs> needed to treat, it comes out at 223. Um, that is annoying, though. It was very annoying. I had to use a calculator. I know. <laughs> Seems like it wouldn't have been that hard for them to do that and report right. the data that way. Well, the number needed to treat for the primary endpoint was 223, yeah. if you actually do the math. Maybe they wanted to leave that out. Maybe they had to, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so impressive. we had some benefit, but 223 is pretty high, relatively speaking, especially when we talk about some of the other stuff. Um, it had some decreased progression to albuminuria, so we thought, huh, maybe there's some positive renal benefit. There was a decrease in a composite um, of a 40% reduction in EGFR, renal replacement therapy, and renal death. Uh, but Canvas trial notably showed an increase in the risk for amputation, which is obviously concerning. We talked about that in our previous episode related to heart failure. It's just big toes, people. It's, it turns out that it was small digit, as I said, it yeah. small digit amputation, so primarily toes, um, <laughs> which nobody wants to lose a toe. Uh, number needed to harm of 300. So that's, you know, number needed to treat of 223 for a cardiovascular benefit, number needed to harm of losing a toe of 300. Um, so it was it was okay. It was it was trending in the right direction as far as SGLT2s 
go and that was the first one we had so we were like huh this is very interesting um and you know they're they're all yelling the other SGLT2s are yelling that it's a class benefit, but the toe thing isn't. You're not, they're like, yeah, the toe thing's an outlier. Don't yeah, worry about that. That's an outlier. But the cardiovascular stuff is a class benefit. Um, so then came a couple of and other trials, flows and, right? yeah. So yeah, and, and initially when this when that amputation stuff came out with Canvas, that that was in that was a box warning on yeah. uh, all of these for a while. They've since removed that because other studies have not showed the same data. So it may have just been a straight up fluke but um the emporeg outcome trial uh with empagliflozin also was kind of set up to do the same thing where they were looking at um non-fetal mind non-fetal stroke cardiovascular death all that good stuff as a primary endpoint and actually saw a reduction in that with uh, empagliflozin and when they looked at some of the secondary data specifically like hospitalization due to heart failure um, the number needed to treat uh, was only 71 compared to placebo um, lower cardiovascular death rates uh, number needed to treat of 45 and uh, macro my, or excuse me microvascular outcomes were reduced as well um, number needed to treat there of 16 um, so some a little bit smaller numbers as far as number needed to treats and uh, it also was beneficial because in, initially all these CVOT or cardiovascular outcome trials were set up basically to show that they were safe to show yeah. that they weren't going to cause more they were going to worsen harm. Cardiovascular yeah, exactly rates. so this was like a big you know exciting moment for all you know everybody in you know, nerding out over this stuff because it was uh, showing not only is it safe, but it's actually beneficial from a cardiovascular yeah. standpoint. I mean, cardiovascular death, number you to treat to 45. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Especially when you consider the composite for Canvas trial was 223. Mm-hmm. Um, so needless to say that this kind of took the cake uh, as far as being compared to Canvas, but then it was actually a while before we got the um, dapagliflozin study that came out it was the declared timmy 58 trial so it was um not as good as Impareg and also not as good as canvas so it kind of did what the study set out to do which was show non-inferiority for reducing cardiovascular events compared with placebo so it didn't worsen cardiovascular um risk but it didn't benefit it either um there were reduced heart failure hospitalizations which was important for trials that we would get eventually um and there was not an increased risk for amputation. So kind of a womp womp on the diabetes front as far as cardiovascular data goes, but kind of sparked the the interest in um, in Farsegar for heart failure. And then there's the fourth one, the ertagliflozin, and this was the Virtus CV trial. I bet you've never heard of that one because nobody <laughs> has. Um, and so it was compared to placebo as well, and the trends were noted for a beneficial effect on renal outcomes, though it wasn't statistically significant. And otherwise, it was kind of um, not that impressive. Yeah. I remember uh, one of the drug groups was telling me, like, you really dive into those renal outcomes. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh because it was trending towards significance but didn't <laughs> actually meet it. No, but that was – so their big claim to fame with or total flows in or Stilatro is basically that it's cheaper than the other ones. Yeah. Um, so there was some Medicaid plans and stuff that it had as their preferred agent, which was very annoying. Um, but from an outcome standpoint, definitely not – one of my one of my go tos. No. Um, what's interesting about like the dapagliflozin though is because that one, you know, didn't really show the primary endpoint as far as superiority like empagliflozin did. They but they did have the heart failure, uh, hospitalization, risk reduction. They did have the CKD uh, and renal outcomes. You know, were beneficial. They kind of went immediately into studying, you know, just from a heart failure, just from a CKD standpoint, and um, kind of got out ahead of the other ones. So listen to our heart failure. Uh, episode of, to, to go in more detail about that. But yes. for a while, it was like only Jardians from, you know, was my go-to. Right. Um, then, you know, like I, we were saying earlier, the the EGFR thing was a concern though. Um, and we we were kind of, I know I, I was personally thinking more along the lines of uh, if, if we do give it to someone with CKD, we're going to potentially cause an AKI worsening, um, you know, dehydration risk, all that stuff like that. So I can, you know, really mess up the kidneys if I do. Um, then the Credence trial came out with canagliflozin in 100 milligrams versus placebo. And this was in patients who had type 2 diabetes, had CKD, and were also taking some form of a RAS blocking therapy, so ACE or ARB. Um, and the, the patients could have an EGFR of 30 to 90. Um, albumin to creatinine ratio could be 300 to 5,000 milligrams per gram. And they were basically looking at renal outcomes as a primary sort of um, – the, the endpoint they also included cardiovascular death as part of that composite but um what they saw is that uh as the egfr declined um the 
benefit from an A1C lowering standpoint eventually ended up meeting placebo to where it was not lowering A1C any, any further. It was working just as well as placebo from that regard. However, the renal outcomes were all still there. And so it's not a matter of it causing harm in renal in uh, CKD patients. And in fact, now we have data down to 20, like we said. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that if you have to get lower A1C and you want to protect the kidneys, just be realistic with you know, your expectations from an A1C lowering standpoint, the further the EGFR goes down. Right. So since we're not just worried about cardiovascular risk for a long time, Jardians was like oh, the best one by far, but we have a number of things that we can consider heart failure, renal issues. So with cardiovascular risk, Jardians still seems to be the number one with, with uh, Invokana a little bit behind. Uh, and then the other two, not really on the radar there. With heart failure, we've got uh, Farsiga and Jardians, and then with renal issues, diabetic kidney disease, we have um, Invokana, and chronic kidney disease, we have Farsiga. But those can be beneficial in those instances. And well. the uh, and the Impegal flows and data is going to look good for yeah. is starting to come out now for the renal as well. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, like Cole said, it's my at least my go tos for most things. If they have diabetes plus ASCVD, heart failure, whatever, I go. Empagliflozin. If it's just heart failure, either empagliflozin or dapagliflozin. If it's just renal issues, then empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and maybe canagliflozin as well. Yeah. But that's kind of how I think about it personally. So those are the SGLT2s. So we've talked about metformin, oral GLP-1, SGLT2s. So we've kind of hit really, you've got a lot of stuff in your holster. If you add in the injectables and the insulin, Probably much of what you would need to get a patient to a good yeah. spot. Um, especially if they're making diet changes. Especially if they're making diet changes. Not all the time, but many times. Um, but there's still a lot of patients on a lot of the other drugs we're about to talk about um, for various reasons, whether they needed to be from, for additional benefit or, or because they couldn't take other things, or because a drug grab got in somebody's ear and so they're, they're on one of these, or because of cost. Um, so it's good for you to know about them, but... If at all possible, I would say try to stick with the ones that we've talked about so far, right? Yep. So the next class is the DPP-4 inhibitors, um, the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. There's four of these as well, Genuvia, Citagliptin, Oncolysa, Saxagliptin, Trojenta, Linagliptin, and Nacina, Atlagliptin. Um, so they prevent DPP-4 from breaking down the increno hormones, GLP-1, um, and doing all the things that GLP-1 does. And that's why you don't want to use these along with the GLP-1 because they're kind of, it's kind of a, a duplication. All the synthetic GLP-1 um, receptor agonists have built-in DPP-4 inhibition. That's why they last so long yeah. in the system, um, or one of the reasons they last so long. So, yeah, giving a DPP-4 inhibitor with GLP-1 is going to give somebody basically more constipation and nausea and not no excess, better. No yeah, extra benefit. No extra benefit of A1C lowering. Um, so they have a, a concern for acute pancreatitis, which we, I don't know if we mentioned that with the GLP-1s, but kind of, oh, we didn't talk about injectable GLP-1s mm-hmm. today. Um, but they kind of carry that that risk as well if somebody has really high triglycerides. Um, and they can increase the risk for heart failure. This is more specific to saxagliptin um, and alogliptin as well. So you'd want to avoid those in a patient who has heart failure. Yeah. Um, the other adverse effects to be aware of, um, they can some in some cases cause some peripheral edema and some GI effects, just like GLP-1s can. Um, all of them have renal dose adjustments um, that need to be done except for linagliptin. So Trojenta, that one does not require any sort of renal dose adjustment. So if you have a patient with more advanced CKD and you want to use one of these, definitely a good option. Um, these medications are all taken once a day. You know, can be taken with or without food, which is nice. They're, they're not like the oral GLP-1 that is, you know, needing the patient to take it a very specific way in regards to food. Um, but they are expensive and they're kind of wimpy. Yeah. medications as far as a1c lowering so not a big fan of these um i tend to think of these as for my patients who don't want injectables they're a1c is an eight on like metformin alone and i need another agent and maybe they don't meet the criteria for an sglt2 inhibitor then maybe i'd throw it on there yeah. so it's usually my older patients and things like that but these are definitely uh nowhere near as impactful in a1c as their glp1 counterparts not even close and so that's the real disadvantage and the other one like mike said is the cost maybe someday when the cost is not a factor at all with these 
than in someone who doesn't want injectables who may be on metformin and SGLT2. You might consider this versus rebelsis or something like that if if like they're going to have issues with taking rebelsis or something like that, you know. But do um, not use a GLP-1 and then DPP-4 inhibitor together. Yes. Just want to really want to drive that home because I yeah. see that all the time. It's done all the time. Yeah. Patients come in, they're like, yeah, I'm taking this and that. And like it'll be in a combo too. So not yeah. only do we have to stop the combo and then restart the metformin by right. itself or whatever, it's a disaster. That's another thing. I, I kind of think of DPP-4 as kind of like, um, kind of like um, HCTZ, which we found is, new, we talked about this earlier, but um, off camera, but new study looking at a versus chlorthalazone, um, take a look at that. But it's in all the combinations. And so that's like how people end up on these things because mm -hmm. it's combined with metformin in a bunch of different ways that like end up on a formulary somewhere. And it, it, I find that people are on it because of that. You yeah. Know? So there's a couple trials. Um, one is the saver Timmy 53 trial with saxagliptin compared to placebo. And this is where we get the concern for heart failure hospitalizations because it did increase hospitalizations due to heart failure. Um, statistically significant versus placebo. There was the TCOS trial, which was citagliptin, cardiovascular safety compared to placebo, showed no increased cardiovascular risk, yay, but no cardiovascular <laughs> benefit. Um, and similarly, the Carmelina trial, which was linagliptin, no increased cardiovascular risk, yay, but no cardiovascular benefit. Yep. So wimpy, wimpy, A1C lowering, expensive, no other benefits like the other drugs have, so that's why we kind of put them down here. When's, when's the last time you actually saw aligliptin? Never. Other than the VA, the VA seemed, I think at least the last time I saw their formula, that that was like the go-to a couple of some of the VAs, but Genuvia and why. Trigenta are the ones I would see the most. Genuvia yeah. like all the time. Yeah, like yeah. Genuvia was common. Uh, and then Ongliza some, and then I don't know that I ever saw Nasina. Yeah. Um, I, the only, I remember when I worked in like retail that we had in my store that I was a manager at, we had three bottles that somebody had ordered to put stickers on them mm -hmm. and then like on the stock bottles and then patient did pick them up so they yeah. rip them and they were ruined you couldn't send them back thousands and of dollars literally sat there until they expired because yeah. no one ever used it at least in you know that regular outpatient setting but um that one uh also showed some like cole was saying the heart failure risk so yes. i agree citigliptin definitely my go-to and then if they have ckd then i'll use the uh, linagliptin trigenta yeah yeah but not with the glp1 not with the glp1 and not if you can Th use that, one of those that options, might even be a question on the quiz and you better not get that wrong <laughs> <laughs> There might be two questions about that. <laughs> yeah. Sulfonia is our best friend. Oh, and I should mention DPP-4 is very safe and very low risk for hypoglycemia yes. Yes, compared yes, yes. to what we're about to talk about. Yeah, this garbage. Yeah. All right, so now we start the garbage portion of the, the episode. Um, Sulfonia is um, glipizide, glimepiride, glipiride, the three most common oral sulfonia that you'll see nowadays. There's others as well, but those are the three most commonly used. These are working basically by stimulating directly the secretion of insulin from the pancreatic beta cells um and so you're you're the thought is you're, yes we're trying to decrease that postprandial spike that we get in blood glucose after a meal but there's not like a, a built-in like timing or safety net so to speak like the glp ones you know have they you know the patients when the blood sugar starts to go up because they've eaten carbohydrates that's mm -hmm. when those kick in so vulnerabilities don't post care yeah they, they don't really care about when your postprandial glucose spike is they start working and that's why some of them have very specific timing you know whether it's 30 minutes before breakfast or with breakfast what have you yeah. um the if you don't eat your you don't blood, take it. your blood sugar is coming down yeah. so um you know the problem with these is the hypoglycemia, especially like in our older patients. Um, mm -hmm. Hypoglycemia risk is definitely a very real thing with sulfonylureas. Um, if a patient uh, like has a allergy to a sulfa antibiotic, um, so sulfamethoxazole, for example, the odds of them having a cross reaction with a sulfonylurea is very, very low because usually it's not true sulfa allergy. It's usually an allergy to sulfonamide or a sulfonamide arylamine um, from like sulfamethoxazole. And so it's not something that we have to worry about uh, in, in, unless it's a true sulfa allergy, which is very, very rare. Uh, but because they're just constantly cranking out insulin every time the patient takes a dose, um, more insulin's available. Um, you know, obviously weight gain is going to be an issue, maybe some nausea. Um, but the hypoglycemia is really the main thing that I always worry about. Um, I also like when I'm explaining it to patients, especially if I'm trying to convince them to switch from, you know, like glimepiride that they've been on for years and years and years and years to something that they is new or like a, an injectable, like, you know, Trulicity or something. Um, 
you know, I have a, sometimes they'll be like, well, I've been on these for a long time. I know they're safe, blah, 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 which in reality, they're probably not as safe as they think, but they've just been on them because they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. I always describe it as like, you know, and, and I actually word it in a way of like when I'm talking to patients, that whole motivational interviewing, which I don't like that term, but I like the concept. Um, and so I'll ask patients like what they want to achieve with, you know, their goals of their diabetes management are, whether it's, you know, more freedom with their diet, come off more medications. And I always give those two examples because they're always going to pick come off of medications mm. if possible. So I put that in my back pocket. And then when I bring up you know, switching this to a GLP-1 or something, I always kind of tell them, well, what these sulfonylurea is, you know, they're basically squeezing your pancreas, never giving your pancreas a chance to take a break, take a back seat, rest, heal. And so we're basically never going to get to the point where we can start getting off the medication because your pancreas is constantly getting beat up, you know, by these sulfonylurea. And, and I'm like, you told me that your goal was to come off medications. This sulfonylurea is basically keeping you on there. And that's just something I tell the patients who are resistant about. And I've, I've say, I will say anecdotally it's worked. <laughs> and the majority mm-hmm. of patients I've, I've had that conversation with. Um, but the hypoglycemia risk is a really big deal, um, yeah. especially in elderly patients. Um, glyburide is the longest acting. So that's the one that has the most hypoglycemia risk associated with it. But all of them can. Um, do you typically, if you have a patient on a GLP-1, do you typically just go ahead and stop the sulfone area? I would like to yeah, do that. Yeah, I do the same as thing. As long as they're fine with that, then I'm stopping them. Even if their A1C needs to come down? Because the way I look at it is like the sulfonylurea is going to create that insulin secretion in the morning or whenever they first took the medication, hopefully the morning. And then all of a sudden they, they, they actually consume carbohydrates and whether that be lunchtime or whenever. And then the GLP-1 kicks in to start lowering that postprandial spike. Well, we've already gotten the beta secretion happening mm-hmm. from you know, the insulin secretion happening. And so you've kind of like offset some of the benefits of the GLP-1. Yeah. So even if their A1C is real high, I stop the sulfonylurea right away, start the GLP-1 or whatever I'm going to use and then go from there. So what's the benefit? They're the cheapest of the ones that we've talked about so far. And so we've been harping on it for a while that um, there are ways to get your patients the other medicines we talked about and you, you, it takes a little extra work. Uh, but I think we're getting to the point where it's just, it, it's even it's even more easy to get the other ones. It's the uninsured patients that make it a little more difficult and there is a little more legwork, um, which is why a lot of people still end up on these. But that's that's the main thing people point to is been around for a long time, so they're comfortable clinician-wise uh, and they're cheap. Yep. They're one of my least favorite classes. Yes. We also have the TZDs, the thiazolidinediones, or the thiazolidinediones. I, yeah, I like it. Um, there's two, there's Actos, pioglitazone, and then rosiglitazone, which has a, um, you don't see that one too much. You don't see that one too much. And we'll tell you why. So they activate peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. Uh, basically they're going to increase peripheral insulin sensitivity. Um, you might consider this in a patient that can't tolerate metformin, but still need an increase in insulin sensitivity. So that's kind of a unique one to these two classes. Metformin can increase insulin sensitivity. All the other ones that we talked about, though they have multiple mechanisms of action, don't really do that. But um, but the TZDs do. And so if I was choosing one, I would choose Actos, but they have some concerns. So there's a box warning for exacerbating heart failure, um, and that's primarily with the data with that is from rosiglitazone in the recover trial or something like that. Um, and then there's an increased MI risk with rosiglitazone as well. So they're contraindicated in... New York Heart Association, class three and four heart failure. Are those New York Heart Association classes still there? Um, yeah, I mean, the people still use it's basically, them. It, yeah. It's basically like they, they've the been, more all progressed, been updated, but yeah. More progressed heart failure. Yeah, um, symptomatic. And of course, you would, as you would expect, adverse effects being peripheral edema and weight gain. They can make you hold a lot of water. Yeah. And so that's obviously not what you want. In a heart failure. In heart failure. So I, I, had, a pay, or I had a friend of mine whose father was on uh, P-glitazone um, from some doc out in the country had um i, th- I believe uh new york um, heart association stage three yeah um symptoms and and basically got put on pinglozone and was like decomp heart failure uh very soon after um didn't realize that was a contraindication and was like oh boy i feel like for a long time these were not even anywhere close to my toolbox it was just not going to happen but the insulin sensitivity thing is important mm-hmm. and I, I remember talking to a diabetes specialist a doc um, who said she would use them Actos on occasion if she wanted to get that insulin sensitivity piece and she would have them monitor. And if they started gaining weight over the first few weeks, like five to 10 pounds, I can't remember exactly what she said. I think probably 10 pounds or something like that. Then she would just stop it because they're holding too much water. But, um, 
it can have that that benefit is is good yeah I've, I've had one patient in particular that i've actually this was my recommendation was to start pigalos and i got looked at like i was a crazy person at first because i always make fun of pigalos as mm-hmm. one of my trash meds but it was same thing like the patient had i think it was after i came up with this after you and i had talked about that doc you talked to um but a patient couldn't tolerate metformin was on an sglt2 inhibitor already in a glp1 so i wasn't having to worry as much about the edema part of it because the sglt2 inhibitor was right, kind of like taking care diuretic. of it and uh, we ended up having on insulin. They didn't want to add more insulin on top of it, but, um, you know, or prandial insulin was on basal insulin. So we gave uh, pioglitazone, and it's, it's kind of in place of the metformin, mm-hmm. and it got the patient to go with, with just that. And pa- the, the primary care provider that had consulted me on that was like, wow, I can't believe that actually. And I was like, yeah, me either. I'm <laughs> really glad. It's only specific instances. Very, very few. It's not everybody's going to get yeah. it, but it's it's you still see it out there a lot, obviously. Yeah. So. Um, besides the increased risk of edema, which can be problematic, there's also an increased risk of fractures. Um, there's even some data that shows that maybe that there's an increased risk of like urinary bladder tumors. So specifically, if anyone has a history or active bladder cancer, we would never use these just in case. Um, also, uh, if they're being given with any sort of um, CYP2CB8 uh, inhibitor inducer, just be cautious there. Um, but again, very... Uh, very low like patient population or very number very low number of patients that I would actually use this with it is super cheap so if I was if financially I was like I had to pick something cheap and I didn't have access to any of the other programs for the newer meds maybe but uh, metformin is usually going to be a better insulin sensitizing med versus yeah. this but metformin obviously is super pocket. cheap I think I mentioned yeah. these other ones that we talked about before were expensive other than metformin super cheap yeah okay so there's two classes that you're never going to use that we'll talk about briefly before we end but one is the meglitinides it's repaglinide prandin and ataglinide starlix so you might be kind of familiar with those brand names Um, but they are going to increase insulin release from intracellular calcium stimulation Um, these are multiple daily doses three times a day before meals they have a risk for hypoglycemia Um, and if you skip a meal similar to the um, sulfonylureas, you're going to want to skip the dose of the medication as well. I might have seen these a couple times. Yeah, I have. I, like I've stopped maybe, a few of patients that were on them. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, three times a day, you got to take them. It's, yeah, pain in the butt. Forget if you, that. If you skip a meal, then they want you to skip the dose of the glutenide as well. And so it's definitely not very convenient for. There's yeah. no no uh, A1s or um, no cardiovascular data that I've ever yeah. seen with these. So definitely not a good option. Um, most likely we just need to stop that and give them something yeah. different. Take take it out of your toolbox. Yeah. Um, the last thing we'll touch on is uh, the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. So the of these two, you may have seen um, Acrobos is probably the more common used one. Um, Miglitol, I can't tell you the last time I saw that, if ever. Yeah. Um, these are basically delaying the uh, hydrolysis of ingested complex carbohydrates and reducing glucose, you know, postprandial peaks. Um if the patient were to have hypoglycemia, this is kind of a counseling point if you ever do run into somebody on these. Uh, if the patient does have hypoglycemia, then you need to treat it with like um, pure like glucose, like glucose tablets or something, not like fruit juice, not table sugar or candy, because those are all mostly sucrose. And mm. because it slows the, the, the hydrolysis of these more complex carbohydrates, you know, whether it's disaccharide or polysaccharide down to the down to glucose, you're not going to actually correct the hypoglycemia. So right. you got to use pure glucose. That's a great counseling point that you may never that have, you will never, never have to know. <laughs> exactly. But now that's what we're, we're, we're but full you know of those. it though. We're full of those here. You know it. Full of something. So hypoglycemia, weight gain, severe GI upset, all potential um, with this class um, does need to be taken with the first bite of each meal. Um, very, very specific. Very specific. Um, kind of aggressive almost. Yeah. Like Don't you, take that second bite. If you take that second bite without putting this other <laughs> pill in your mouth, you're going to be grounded. <laughs> so, yeah, those last two classes, probably stay away from those or yeah. switch them to something better if you do have a patient on them. Yeah. Uh, what else, man? Anything else specifically with these? Those are the, That's the big stuff for the oral diabetes meds. Um, what do you think, AJ? We miss, what did we miss? Anything? I liked it. I actually did research into beta glucosidase mm-hmm. in undergrad. And ah. so uh, that's the enzyme that... The we lesser actually, glucosidase? No, we don't have it, but animals have it. Like cows ah. have it. It breaks down that lignocellulosic uh, matter, kind of like the that, that corn stuff. stalk. The, mm-hmm. So the part of the plants that we can't break down, we can't eat, oh, they can. And they can actually get uh, actually like nutrition from it. But we were using that to turn it into fuel kind of thing. 
Oh, never did. Never did. But did it work? No. <laughs> But yeah, I thought it was cool. Absolutely not. No, that is very interesting. So that's when I learned about glucosidase and how alpha glucosidase is actually an essential enzyme in humans. So I don't know why we'd be inhibiting it, but yeah. Huh. That's my two cents. I appreciate it. Um, AJ, we switched my computer real quick just so we can throw a shout out our sponsor of today's episode and all of our other ones. Uh, they've been our number one sponsor uh, for over a year now um mm. but pearls.com if you guys have not downloaded the app or they also have a um like a desktop version that you can download so it's like uh you can download directly to your desktop and pull it up um without having to go on the internet um it is a great drug info tool uh, they have all kinds of great clinical pearls uh, they have comparison charts they have side effect charts they have uh, algorithms for treatment um and you know ch- utilizing you know, pharmacotherapy for various disease states. Um, so pearls.com, P Y R L S.com slash core consult RX. You will see the screen here. Welcome friends of core consults. That's you guys. And, uh, by signing up you, it's free to sign up. You'll get some free PDFs. Um, this nice diabetes pharmacotherapy that was just updated this year. Um, algorithm, uh, basically just summarizing all the ADA recommendations and, um, treatment algorithms, but you'll get this PDF and some others that you can keep for free. And, uh, if you like the app, you can always upgrade and get the, you know, the professional version, which gives you access to everything on there. Um, or you can give, keep using the free one. Um, and if you don't like, it, you don't have to upgrade by any means. Um, you get to keep your free charts, but, uh, pearls.com slash core consult RX, check them out. Um, they've been updating their stuff, you know, pretty much every month and, uh, adding more and more drugs to their, um, their list of medications that they have pearls on. So very good uh, tool to use. So check them out. They've been a very big supporter of the podcast. Um, so big thanks to pearls and uh, we'll link them in the show notes as well. Anything else, Cole? That's all I got. All right, man. Um, so as far as again, getting your credit, the, the password is DM meds, all capital letters, and, uh, make sure you go on freec.com, get your credit and, uh, yeah, we appreciate you guys um, sticking with us, uh, and, and you know we're well in our underwear way to episode three hundred already. <laughs> okay, we're well, not really, but <laughs> eventually. Um, but no, if, the, if you guys have any questions, any you know comments, or you have any suggestions for topics for Cole, myself, or AJ, our emails will be in the show notes. Um, you can also reach us on any of the social media platforms. Uh, if you want more like traditional lecture style. Uh, videos, lectures, you know, whatever, um, patreon.com slash core consult RX. Um, that'll also be in the show notes. You can download, uh, all the, the slide sets that we have. Um, and it's all broken up by, by, uh, disease state and, um, basically runs through the pharmacotherapy of, of these various disease states and has, uh, all of them have their own, uh, PowerPoint slides attached to them. That you can download, um, Three dollars a month, or like thirty dollars and some change for a year to get access to everything. Um, at least one lecture, usually a week, goes on there. Plus pharmacotherapy practice questions as well. So uh, make sure you guys check that out. And um, yeah, if you guys have anything else for us, we'll see you uh, in the emails. You, the, if you want to text us directly, that will be in the show notes as well. That number, send a text there. And we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Been trying to answer more emails lately, but uh, yeah, bear with us if we don't get better right back to you. AJ, anything else you want to say before we get out of here? That's it. All right, guys. We'll see you in the next episode. Have a good one.